Welcome, everybody, to the Winner's Circle Sports Betting Channel. My name is Ross Benjamin, host of the Winner's Circle Sports Betting Podcast. And like every Monday, and it is Monday, February the 12th, I am joined by Mr. Doug Upstone of DocSports.com. You know, Doug, um, it's a time of year where football fans are in mourning because, uh, you know, the whole season has come to a close, uh, the buildup and the hype going into the Super Bowl, the excitement of watching the Super Bowl and all the entertainment that surrounds it, and then the game is over and you wake up the next morning and you come to the realization there's no more football for at least six months unless you play those gimmick leagues like you do uh, in the spring. But in any event, Doug, how are you? Yes, I, I, I'm good. And yes, UFL coming up uh, March 30th, I think, is, is when that starts. And then the uh, Canadian football. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, it's 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 over. But, you know, like any season, when, when you get to the end of it, in truth, I mean, um, um, you know, I am not a um, well, just, I mean, partly because of what we do. But, you know, I, I love professional football, everything else. But, you know, it's time to move on to something else. That's all. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. ready to do, I'm ready for something else. And especially with baseball coming, definitely ready for that pitchers and catchers report this week. So that that's of note. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I'm certainly not broken hearted about it. Hey, but I did want to ask your thoughts. Um, the, uh, the, so, well, some of the decisions potentially by Kyle Shanahan uh, that have been discussed roundly, uh, at the end of the game and quite a bit afterwards. And I'm sure certain every uh, local uh, talk sports radio today. What, uh, what were your thoughts on that? All right. What, give me specifics because. Well, well specifically I, for I, example, the overtime deal, you okay. know, uh, where he, where he chose to uh, take the ball instead of quote unquote, doing the smart thing and, uh, and, and kicking off, you know, for the uh, overtime. Yeah. Um, I, I, I had a problem with that because, you know, you look at the college game um, and, and there's a reason why whoever wins the coin flip decides to play defense first. They want to see what they need to do uh, when if the other team does score. And, you know, a little bit of a different game, though, in Shanahan's defense as opposed to college where you get the ball at the 25-yard line of the opposing territory. Um it's a short field and, you know, it, more times than not, it's going to result in some type of score. And then the ensuing drive, the team that deferred and chose to play defense first now gets the ball back and they uh, know what they have to do in terms of tying the game with a touchdown, winning the game with a touchdown or tying the game with a field goal. And sometimes even just kicking a field goal to win if the opposing team did right. not score. Um, but it's a little different in the NFL because you actually kick the ball off. You start in, they ended up starting from knowing 25 yard line. Now, having said that, um, if I'm on the San Francisco side, I certainly would question that because a, you're going against Patrick Mahomes and, um, I would want to know what I had to do first. Because you drove the ball down to the four-yard line of Kansas City or um, San Francisco. Excuse me, Kansas City on, on your opening drive. Right. And uh, you set up for a field goal, which they should have done with the first possession in overtime. And then hope that your defense comes up big. But again, you got to factor in who you're playing against. Now, with the same set of circumstances uh, and being hypothetical, um, if, if indeed – uh, they deferred, and they chose to kick off, and Mahomes took them right down the field and scored a touchdown like they did. Well, now, if if you could replicate the drive you had on your opening drive and change that over to the second drive because you deferred, now you know you have to go for a touchdown from the four-yard line instead of settle for a field goal. So, yeah, I didn't like that decision whatsoever. I, I liked it because only because – uh, I had Kansas City on both the point spread and the money money line, so I was quite pleased that he chose to do that. Um, but from a San Francisco standpoint and just from an objective uh, standpoint, I think that was a huge mistake. Yeah, the you know the I, I guess I you know there's there's two things I guess that struck me, and, and one of them had to do afterwards. 
I did not at the time necessarily disagree with the decision. And the reason that I didn't is because the defense was gassed. I mean, they were, they were out and I mean, it, and it looked like it would be Atlanta and new England all over again. Okay. Almost the same set, same sec, same set of circumstances were ready to go other than the fact that the overtime rules had changed. And so, yep. you know, new, new England scored, got the ball right back. Okay. Uh, and went and won the Super Bowl. Uh, so f- from that standpoint, it, it, I, I didn't have a problem with it. What, what became more of a problem was to learn after the game that the, the, his reason for thinking was that it was based on analytics and the analytics in the context of what you're going to do if the game continues and you get to a third possession. And it's like, why you would be worrying about a third possession in an overtime, yeah. I have no idea. Okay. I mean, that, that makes no sense to me. And then it was compounded by making it worse uh, this morning to learn that uh, there were players, starting players on the team, uh, Jersic, uh, and uh, who was the other one? There was somebody else that they had no idea that those were the rules of overtime. They said it had never been brought up. And so I, I, I don't know. So I thought that was, I thought that was pretty unusual, you know, uh, to that standpoint, more than anything though, Ross, in terms of the outcome of the game, to me, San Francisco had the lead four different times and they, and they couldn't hold it. And to me, that's the game. Simple as that. You know, if, yeah. if you have the lead that often in a football game, especially well, any football game and you don't win, then that's on you. So that's, you know, that's, that, that's my final take on the whole situation. Uh, San Francisco better. Yeah, probably not a lot, but a little bit better, but one team's got Patrick Mahomes and the other one doesn't It's simple as that. And that seemed to be the difference in the game. Although I thought Purdy played a solid game. I will oh, say did. this yeah. too. I, I will say this too, Doug, and I don't know how much of this came up because <clears throat> I haven't listened to much in the media today. Uh, cause I've been so enthralled with my work this morning and basketball, but, um, uh, I would say that I thought that uh, Shanahan, once again, and, and it was brought up last week, and Sean Higgs was a real, you know, stickler on this, that he just hoped he had San Francisco, but he just hoped that Shanahan didn't go in the tank with his play calling like he had uh, in a lot of big games in the past. And I didn't understand why – McCaffrey was having some limited success in the first half and early in the second half. Getting, he wasn't breaking long runs, but he was consistently getting anywhere from three to five yards per carry. And I thought that they got away from the running game way too much. I mean, your identity is to run the ball. And I just thought they became a little bit pass happy, uh, especially in the beginning of the second half where they went three and oh on or three and out on three consecutive offensive possessions to start mm-hmm. the half. But, I mean, um, again, was that the tell factor of the game? No. The the tell factor of the game was is that Patrick Mahomes, um, when push comes to shove, and it's a big game, and uh, uh, it's a tight game, uh, look, it, there's no other quarterback in football I'd rather have. Right. Uh, there's, he's head and shoulders the, the best uh, of the best right now. And, you know, I, I know I'm a big Josh Allen guy, but – I often say that if if I was to choose one other quarterback other than Josh Allen, uh, I w- unequivocally would want Patrick Mahomes. And not only because I didn't have Josh Allen, because I think he's the best. You know, he's 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 head and shoulders the best, in my opinion, especially when it comes to big games. We saw a Kansas City team that really, Doug, was pretty limited – offensively, you know, in terms of skill position players and what they could do. Oh yeah, no question. I mean, this of the, you know, of the teams that have been to the Super Bowl, uh this was far and away the weakest, but yeah. the, the the genius of Andy Reid to, you know, figure out how to how to move the ball, to how to do something uh w- with the ball was very important and I would want to f- follow or finish this off with uh, Kyle uh Shanahan. I saw this Last night, I think it was the so he's been a head coach and an offensive offensive coordinator in three Super Bowls. And in those games in the second half, his team has been outscored 74 to 29. So if that doesn't tell you something right there, I don't know what else there is to say. You know, 
So yeah, just, I mean, just, part of that is if you gave up 74 points in the second half and three Super Bowls, is your defense isn't doing the job. And I don't know right. how much that has to do with him, but the 29 points, less than 10 points in the second half, and then the disparity in those numbers, which I just touched upon, uh, you got to you got to cast some blame on the defense. But again, like I said, I thought that he gave up, not gave up on the run, but I don't think he used his run game in what the team identifies itself with offensively as much as he should have in the second half. And he got away from it and became a little pass happy. But um, and they again, should have been up more great. in the first half, too. I mean, yeah, realistically, exactly. I mean, it should have. I, I can't say that it can pinpoint to one thing, but it, by by how the play was, it should have been 17 to three by by yeah. how the game was going. And so if that's the case, that's a whole different dynamic, but it didn't happen. And Kansas City's the back to back champion. And Ross, you know, I don't know if you heard they're coming back to win three in a row. I don't know if you heard that yeah. or not last year. Yeah, night, the whole thing I, with Andy Reid coming back and, and Travis Kelsey, there was whispers of him retiring. Right. And Andy Reid retiring, but you know, they're both coming back. And you know, then you had the incident on the sideline with um Andy Reid and Travis Kelce, which I thought is overblown. I, that's just my opinion. I just thought that Andy Reid lost this balance and and Kelce was just a little bit, uh, you know, he was a little bit over exuberant in, when he bum rushed him, for lack of a better phrase, and knocked him off his balance. But, I mean, you got to realize too, folks, these are two guys who have been together for a long time. So it's not like it's some rookie running up to him and yelling at Skur, some first-year player on Kansas City's roster. These guys have been together for a long time. And uh, I, I just think, I don't know about you, Doug, but I thought that whole incident there was just uh, a little bit dramatized too much. Yeah, well, I mean, the I, I, I when it happened, I, I thought immediately, I'm, I wasn't surprised, and why I wasn't surprised – because they showed Kelsey, I, I I usually don't watch it. To start watching about fifty minutes before kickoff, I don't watch any of the other stuff. It's not of interest to me. Perfect, be perfectly honest. But I watched it, and the couple times they showed him, he was just like, you know, when he's warming up, his eyes were like this big. He, I mean, he was so stoked, and he was obviously very easily frustrated. And by the way, I, I saw this yesterday, and I just passed it along. Uh, you can look for it yourself, but. There was a meme on it uh, just a little after halftime, okay, about what happened, and it, and what it's it, so it shows Kelsey yelling at at uh, at the coach, and this, as he's yelling, and the words were, "Coach, you have to, we have to win this game because she's Taylor Swift will break up with me, and then she'll end up writing a song about you if we don't win." So uh, I thought that was to the drama, adding to the drama. <laughs> Leave it to Doug. Anyway, uh, we are sponsored by gamblersworld.net. And uh, there you'll find myself and nine other great handicappers. If you were with us yesterday or with me yesterday, I had the Chiefs uh, plus two. I had the Chiefs on the money line. I had the Chiefs in, uh, in the 49ers under 47 and a half. I know some of you might think I'm lucky because I won an overtime and it stayed under by half a point. But I don't know. Did anybody really think that I don't deserve to hit that under? I mean, that was an under all the way. It went overtime. And Doug, I want to let you know, um, and I don't mean to rub salt in the wound. I had five picks last week that went in overtime. I won four of them. So, okay. All yeah, right. Well, I, I I'll have something about that in a little bit here. So yes, I, the, I mean, <laughs> I, I actually know somebody else that did that too, as, as a matter of fact. So it was, uh, is that right? Yes, I, that went four out of five, and uh, I, I don't know what it was. Last week there, you know, uh, you, you uh, myself, this other person, I don't know what it was last week about overtime, but there was plenty of games that, uh, for whatever yeah, reason. the one I lost was the, the triple overtime game, um, Arizona and uh, I want to say Oregon. I, 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 oh, I can't remember. Utah, Utah. yes. Utah. And it went triple overtime, and I was catching five and a half, and he lost by six, so – um, that was a tough one, but I had a, I was very lucky on a couple NBA totals that were the game was under and regular during regulation time, but went over because of the overtime, you know. So, and then yesterday, of course, and that helped me too when I went overtime because I had a prop uh, on uh, Isaiah Pacheco over 15 and a half carries, and uh, 
he had three carries in overtime to go to 18 carries. So that got me a win there. So um, I was pretty, pretty pleased there. Also, I had some props on the show last week. I had, uh, I had the 49ers under three and a half in the first quarter for their team total. They didn't score for the third straight uh, postseason game. Yep. San Francisco was held scoreless. I had them under 11 and a half in the first half. They were up 10 to three at the half. I had the 49ers under 24 and a half, and they went under the total. I missed on the Pacheco over the total rushing um, mm -hmm. in longest run of 15 and a half yards. It was a great day. All, all together between the props and my plays, I went five and two. Um, and Doug, uh, tell the folks a little bit about what's going on with you at uh, Doc Sports. Before we get into our two college basketball games, folks, both ESPN nationally televised games. Uh, so we'll get right to them. Just bear with us for another second or so. Yes. Uh, the uh, Well, the one thing that uh, I was uh, was surprised, Ross, you're talking about overtime. On Saturday, I hit two overtime games. And so I, I was wondering if hell froze over or I looked out the window to see if <laughs> pigs were flying. OK, uh, so but I did go two and oh in overtime on Saturday. So that was good. So that helped make it a, a nice winning day just overall. I didn't have the success. I went with Cleveland. Excuse me, I went with uh, Kansas City on the first half. And uh, obviously San Francisco's defense bottled them up the first half. So that that didn't work out for me. Hit a number of props. The only one I the, my main prop that I wanted to hit was Pacheco anytime touchdown. I had a couple potential opportunities. He fumbled one time and he only had a one yard run when they were at the four yard line. They never went back to him again. So that didn't work out. But I hit a, a number of other uh, nice props. Uh, Kelsey, that was late too, uh, over for receiving yards. Uh, what was it? What was the other one? Oh, uh, both teams to have a field goal of over 33 and a half yards and yeah. being the two longest field goals ever kicked in the uh, Super yeah. Bowl. So that, that was unusual. So, yeah. So, I mean, you know what? Some, you know, with, with some of the prop stuff, you you know, when the game gets going, how the outcome of some of these things is just all up in the air. I mean, some of the guys that, I mean, look at the three of the four touchdowns, Ross. I mean, <laughs> they were unsuspecting characters. Let's put it that way. Yes. So, yes. That, that just, that's yeah, just how it and goes. And the teams, uh, would they, they settled for uh, how many field goals uh, a yeah. piece? What? Uh, let's yeah, see, I don't 20, remember, but yeah, like four three or in, four. Yeah, I mean, there was like seven field goals in the game, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Um, yeah, and they made so, them all. And then he, yeah, and they made them all. And, and lo and behold, the poor kid missed that extra point, and that ultimately was um, – it's not the reason why they lost, but it certainly came into play yeah. uh, because instead of being up four, they were up three, and there you go. So anyway, all right, let's get with the, uh, the big Monday. And uh, Doug is going to be looking at the game between – uh, Wake Forest and Duke, and um, that game goes at 7 p.m. Eastern time at Cameron Indoor Arena. Right now, Duke is a seven-point favorite. The total is 152. Don't look now, but uh, Wake is having a, a very quietly, they're going about their business and having a really good year, and uh, you can make a case vastly overachieving at this point. Yeah, and this what you know, the uh, Wake Forest goes into Krzyzewskiville and uh, uh, talk about your house of horrors. Well, it doesn't get much worse than this. They've lost 24 in a row, okay, at in, at Durham. They're 8-16 and 16 against the spread in those games. In fact, the last time they won a game in Durham was when their player named Tim Duncan was on, on, the, on, the, yeah. on the Wake Forest roster, and they had the number two team in the country, and Mr. Duncan scored 26 points in that game. But that was 1997. Now we're talking 2024. Now, Wake Forest has won three consecutive games, and their shooting percentage has been exceptional in those games, and they have moved up to 35th in field goal percentage accuracy. Uh, for them, I think that's going to be the key to the game because they're going to have to match points with Duke. Now, they have the mental aspect of getting over to try and finally win a game. But if, if they can at least match points, that would help. Problem, though, that they have is that on the a, a, at the ACC road, they are one in four straight up and against the spread. Uh, their field goal percentage defense is above average at 42.7%, but it's going to have to be a lot better against Duke to really get to compete in this one. Now, Duke has won five out of their last six. Uh, their only setback was at Chapel Hill. Four of those victories have come by double digits. Uh, the uh, Blue Devils actually are even better in their field goal percentage at number uh, th uh, 31. 
and their three-point accuracy nationally is 29th behind the arc. Uh, they only give up 67 points per game, but some of that, it's not it's, it's a little misleading because they played some bad teams, beat them badly. They're shooting percentage defense. They're giving up 43%, and if you watch Duke games, they do have lapses in, in games where they just give up a volume of, of shots. You know, for example, maybe five possessions they'll give up, uh, five straight baskets or four straight baskets. Uh, this encounter, Ross, well, it's an evil one, okay? The Demon Deacons against the Devils who are blue, okay, for this one. Now, originally, I was thinking over on this one, but the total jumped from 151 and a half to 154. So I went to, to look at the side in Duke. Uh, if they're off two straight wins by 10 or more points, they're uh, two and nine against the spread. And if they're a home favorite in this price range of six and a half to, to nine, which at minus seven they are, they're only eight and 21. So I'm going to say Wake loses the game, but they cover the spread in this one and they get the job done for me uh, here on the show. All right. So Wake Forest plus the seven on the road against Duke. Um, I said 152. And that was a couple hours ago. I didn't look at the recent update. Doug says it's up to 154 now. Yep. So I stand corrected there. Um, and But... <clears throat> You know, Duke's on a three-game win streak. Doug mentioned how good they're shooting. Uh, over that three-game win streak, they're shooting 52.8%, uh, averaging over 87 points per game. It, not like they played real stiff competition during those three, but still, uh, shooting the ball against anybody that well and scoring that well in, in ACC play is something that's noteworthy. Now, Wake Forest has gone 0-4 straight up in ATS uh, in true road, true road games when they're an underdog this year. However, those four losses only came by an average of 8.5 points per game. So um, it's a lot. Of, a few of those losses were in the three, four, four and a half point range, kind of uh, as far as underdogs go. And uh, they're not getting blown out. In in this particular instance, they're they're catching a big number of seven. And you know what, Duke, uh, it just doesn't seem like they're as invincible as they've been in recent years when playing at home, Doug. I mean, they've already suffered two home losses, uh, albeit Arizona is, is not a bad loss, but still they lost by five to Arizona. They got upset by Pitt by four, and then uh, they got, had two other close calls at home. Mm -hmm. They barely escaped in a controversial win over Clemson, 72-71. And then as a 17-and-a-half point favorite, uh, they only beat Georgia Tech by five. So it's not like they've been invincible this year on the road. And uh, don't get caught up with that 0-4 straight up in ATS as a road underdog in two road games for Wake Forest. Like I alluded to, uh, they're not getting blown out, and they were small underdogs on average in all four of those games. So uh, I agree with Doug. Uh, I think Wake is the play here, plus the seven. Uh, at Duke on Monday night. Now I'm going to look at Kansas and Texas Tech, and uh, let me get to that quickly here, and then we'll get Doug's retort. Um, Texas Tech right now is a three-point favorite. The total in this game is 144 and a half. That was it as of uh, two hours ago. So again, folks, we're recording around 1 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. Uh, Kansas, their last three true road games. Uh, all resulted in losses, losing to Kansas State, Iowa State, and West Virginia. Um, so, in matter of fact, in conference play this year, they're just one and four straight up, and uh, their other loss came against UCF. So, I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed of losing at Iowa State, but losing to Kansas State in that rivalry game last Monday night in overtime, and then losing – as a big favorite on the road against West Virginia and Central Florida is a bit concerning uh, when, when you look at uh, Kansas' resume in terms of when they play on the road. Now, Texas Tech, on the other hand, 12-1 and one straight up at home, 17-6 and six overall, number 13 nationally on offensive efficiency. Uh, and again, this is a Texas Tech team with their style of play <clears throat> to can really frustrate Kansas, and I think that will be the case tonight. As opposed to Kansas, Texas Tech likes to play at an extremely slow tempo. And uh, on the other hand, Kansas State likes to play very fast. All right, so also Texas Tech, keep in mind, number 25 nationally in three-point shooting. 
at 37.5%. And then within ACC play, they're the top three-point shooting team in conference play at 40.1%. Kansas, by the way, is last in the Big 12 uh, when it comes to uh, three-point shooting at 29.2%. Uh, they're also not very good at defending the three. Uh, so uh, something to keep in mind when it comes to uh, those comparisons. Uh, in field goal attempts, in terms of threes, uh, Kansas shoots the three okay, but they don't shoot a lot of threes. They only average six three-point makes uh, a game, and uh, that ranks number 322 nationally in terms of their three-point attempts as well. Uh, last in the Big 12 defensive rebounding is, is uh, Texas Tech. That's a concern, but Kansas is 12th out of 14 teams when it comes to offensive rebounding. Now, a big. This is a a lot bigger game for Texas Tech than Kansas. They're they're a half a game behind uh, the Jayhawks in the Big Twelve standings. And after tonight, uh, they have six. They'll have six Big Twelve games remaining, and four of those games will be played on the road. Uh, so I'm going to lay to three here with Texas Tech. They opened at one and a half. They went to three. Looks like a sharp move to me. Uh, I'm going to take Texas Tech here, lay to three over Kansas, Doug. I'm going to agree with you, Ross, on this, and just for some different reasons, okay? Uh, first, first of all, on Saturday, uh, it was obvious that Kansas missed Kevin McClure Jr. not playing, and right now all reports show that he is unlikely to play, and I would think if he could play, he certainly would want to because he came to Kansas from Texas Tech. Okay, Texas so Tech, yeah. uh, so from that standpoint, I think he's he definitely would, would want to play. The other thing, if you watch Baylor in Kansas, is that uh, Dejon Harris – uh, did uh, hurt his ankle? Okay, in in that game, and he was limping around. I when I, I watched that on tape when I got home Saturday, and so with with, with that, uh, you know, he 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 came back in the game, but he wasn't, you know, lacked some movement. Now I think he's going to play, but you know how those ankles can be, especially when you twist them. I mean, it doesn't take much to retwist it again, and so I wonder about his overall effectiveness. I still think this is going to be a, a pretty close game because it's Kansas just in general, but I think the Red Raiders. I think they win and cover and what they have to do, protect the ball, don't turn the ball over, play their typical defense, and they're a very good free throw shooting team. So, so if they make their free throws at the end of the game, I think they win and cover, Ross, and agree with you. All right, so there you go. Our, our two official picks, Wake Forest plus the seven from, from Doug and uh, Texas Tech minus the three from yours truly. And both of us agree with each other's picks, which doesn't happen all the time. So watch out, folks. Uh, I hit last week, by the way, folks, my college basketball free picks on the show went 3-0, and so let's make it 4-0 and today. Um, and Kevin McCuller, uh, interesting you brought that up because as a freshman at Texas Tech, he was on that team that went to the national championship yep. game and lost in overtime. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's a big loss for Kansas if he's unavailable to go tonight. Right now he's being listed as questionable. Uh, he did, like Doug said, he didn't play in the last game, so we'll see what happens. Uh, but in any event, there's our picks, folks. Doug, tell the folks a little bit about what's going on with you at DocSports.com and what you foresee in the upcoming week or any else you would like to share with the audience sure and, and i'll make it snappy here the uh so uh, the nhl continues to do well i hit a, another best bet over the weekend so that takes me to 10 and 3 on best bets of late and up 31 or on a 31 and 21 run in the nhl so we got some continue to have some good action there actually on a month on monday i got a must go 2 and 0 package that's available so that's at the dug up some page at doc sports right now uh nba action uh had a i was red hot for a while, then I really cooled off, but now starting to, to come back, went to uh, 2 and 0 on, on Saturday night, so that was nice. Looking, I got another play that I believe is going to be a blowout on Monday, and uh, so got, got a, some good things going there with the NBA and looking to improve upon that, get hot again. And props, uh, I didn't, like I said, haven't done as well as I have liked, but if you go to early December, I, I'm still on props uh, for, from the Super Bowl I'm referring to, sorry, is I'm hitting 62% on props since late December. So that's basically eight weeks uh, in the area of the time frame. So I'm going to look to continue to do NBA props the uh, rest of the regular season. And once we get into um, probably mid mid-April or later, for baseball and get some numbers, then I'll start in with my baseball props, which did very well last year. Ross, I'm turning it over to you quickly right now. 
It's been a great weekend um, over at gamblersworld.net where I went 7-2-1. and one. Uh, Didn't use any props on the site because they didn't have any props that I, I wanted to use. So just st stayed with my sides and totals in college basketball. Same thing with the uh, NFL yesterday. I did add a money line pick on Kansas City as well. So it was a very profitable weekend. Folks, something to keep an eye on over at gamblersworld.net with me is my college basketball totals. Been on fire with those. I've hit the last six, and uh, I'm 65 and 33, which is good for 66% with my last 98 college basketball totals. College basketball overall, 11 and 5 run right now. My NBA sides uh, since April 11th of last year, a solid 67 and 44, which is good for 60%. My money line picks in the NBA, never give out anything more than minus 140 there. And a couple of underdogs mixed in uh, on a tremendous 37 and 14 run with my NBA money line picks. That goes back to 2020. Don't give out a lot of those, uh, but when I do, you need to pay attention. And my NBA top plays uh, on a 39 and 21 run, top plays over at gamblersworld.net, I deem to be four units and greater. Uh, so 39 and 21, a 65% run with my NBA top plays. A lot of good stuff. And don't forget, when you go to gamblersworld.net, folks, not only myself, nine other great handicappers, we guarantee our selections. What does that mean? It quite simply means any single game or multi-game daily package or any subscription plan of 30 days or fewer. If you do not win or make a profit, we will credit your account back the exact amount of the money you spent. Okay, so there's been some incidents of late where people can't wrap their head around uh, what the credit policy is. Uh, there's certain times when a customer will pay uh, for a pick or a package entirely with the credit he has in his account. If you lose and you didn't pay a dime, we're not going to credit you back the exact amount of the, uh, the, the whatever the handicapper was charging for that specific uh, pick or package. So just keep that in mind, folks. I think we're more than fair with that policy. And uh, I, I hopefully uh, we got our point across here and it's fully understood at this point. Um, don't forget, folks, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, please take a second to do so. Obviously, you like sports betting. You love sports betting. You're watching us um, and uh, some of the best handicappers in the country and uh, myself and Doug and also uh, Sean Higgs and Jesse Shule and Chip Cherimbus and Paul Bovey and, and who am I missing? Uh, whoever else I'm missing here. Uh, but by the same token, now Matt Fargo is going to be joining us pretty soon. So looking forward to having Matt on the show and some other great guests uh, in, in the future. So just hit that subscribe button. And if you're new, uh, go into your YouTube settings. By the way, if you have subscribed already and you haven't done this, we'd recommend you do so. Go into your YouTube settings and click on the alert notification bell for uh, the Winner's Circle Sports Betting channel, and you'll be notified upon any of our five to six podcasts per week um, being published on our great channel. Folks, until the next time, Doug will be back with us on Thursday. We'll be talking more college basketball at that particular moment in time. I'll be back tomorrow morning with Sean Higgs and Jesse Shule. More college basketball to be discussed. Jesse and Sean will be back with me on Wednesday as well. And on Friday, our live show with Jesse and Sean uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Make note of that, folks. It's your opportunity to chime in with all your questions and comments. And uh, we'll get to as many of those questions and comments and reply uh, time permitting. All right, Doug, uh, always a pleasure, my man. You have a great week. And uh, let's uh, I look forward to seeing you on Thursday for Doug Upstone and Ross Benjamin. We'd like to wish each and every one of you all the very best. Take care and God bless, folks.